Good morning, my name is Kyle, and as you heard, I'm one of the pastors here. If you could take your Bible and turn to the Gospel of John, in chapter 21, if you don't know where that is, there's a table of contents for you in the front of your Bible. It might be the easiest to turn to Acts and then just look back a page. Well, this is my last sermon for two and a half months, and I'm not really sure what I'm going to do now or with myself, but, uh, but I'll miss you. John begins his gospel by saying in chapter 1, verse 18, that no one has seen God at any time. But the only God who is at the Father's right side, or the only God who literally leans into the Father's chest. He has made him known. In other words, what John is saying at the very beginning of this gospel is that if you want to know God, then you need to know Jesus. You need to know the one who is at the heart of the Father. If you want to know who God is, then you have to know his authorized representative, who is the one who is at who leans in his bosom. We don't know who writes the Gospel of John. The author is not revealed until the very end of the book in the passage that was just read. We read in verse 24, this is the disciple who is bearing witness about these things. Now, who is this disciple? Verse 20, the disciple whom Jesus loved, the one who also leaned back against him, or literally leaned against his chest, his bosom, during the supper. Do you hear what John's saying? If you want to know who God is, then you have to know who Jesus is. You have to know the one who leaned against the Father's bosom from the beginning. But if you want to know who Jesus is, then you have to get to know John, who leaned against Jesus' bosom at the Last Supper. You see, the one who is in the bosom of the other, he's the authorized representative. And so let me ask you, do you want to know God? Then take a Bible and open it up to this passage. Let me pray for us. Triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we ask that you would come in your threefold word. You have given us a threefold word. The word of God incarnate, the second person of the Trinity. The word of God written down and recorded in your scripture. And the word that comes through the preaching of the gospel. We ask that you would unite these now and that they might be life to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, in the 1984 best picture, Amadeus, we, re, or we watched the story of the rivalry between Antonio Salieri and Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. Salieri, his whole life, all he wanted to be was a composer. In fact, so much so that when he was a little boy, when he was a child, he prayed to God and he said, God, if you will make me a great composer, then I will serve you with my life, I will serve you with my music, I will serve you with everything. And it seemed that God granted that request. He was educated in Vienna. What at that point was the high, uh, is the center of 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 music and composition and the arts. And then he was commissioned as the court composer for the Emperor Joseph II. Mozart arrived in Vienna due to his patron, the Prince Bishop of Salzburg, calling him to go there. Salieri showed up because he wanted to meet Mozart, and he also wanted to hear him play. In that encounter, Salieri, he took away two things. 
The first thing that he took away is that Mozart is an absolutely despicable human being. And the second thing that he took away is that Mozart has a God-given gift and his music is transcendent. Well, Salieri wasn't the only person to actually recognize Mozart's talent. Uh, the emperor, Emperor Joseph II, he wanted an opera written, and he commissioned not Salieri, but Mozart to write the opera. And Salieri was enraged. He could not believe that the emperor chose Mozart over him, and yet he could believe it because he knew... <coughs> He knew just how talented Mozart was. And he was not only enraged, I mean, he was confused and he was frustrated with God. There's this one scene in the movie where Salieri looks up at a cross and after a long pause, he says, from now on we are enemies, you and I. Because you will not enter me with all my need for you. Because you scorn my attempts at virtue. Because you choose for your instrument a boastful, lustful, smutty, infantile boy. And give me for reward only the ability to recognize his ability. Because you are unjust, unfair, unkind. I will block you. Salary's final declaration there is no God of mercy, just a God of torture. When Salieri looked at his life, he said, Why, God, why would you give such talent to Mozart, this despicable human being, over me? I wonder if you can relate to Salieri. It's just not fair. Sometimes life just isn't fair. And we look around and maybe we compare ourselves to others and we say, why do they have this job and I don't? Why? What did they see in her that they didn't see in me? Why, why can't my spouse be more with it? And why do they take so much emotional time and energy? Well, we compare. We compare not only our triumphs, but we also compare our trials. How come they have debilitating health problems and I don't? How come, how come they've had such a hard time having children and we haven't? I wonder if you can relate to Salieri. I think Peter can relate to Salieri. We saw last week that Peter has just been commissioned by Jesus, and he gets this amazing commission. They are out on the shore of a lake. Jesus takes him for a reunion after his resurrection. They are sitting by a fire. They are eating, and Jesus asks him three times, Peter, do you love me? And three times Peter says, Jesus, you know that I love you. And then Jesus says, feed my sheep. He gives this prestigious commission to Peter. He says, Peter, you are going to be a pastor. I am calling you to be a pastor. But he not only called Peter to pastor, he also called Peter to endure persecution. Because right after that, he gives Peter some pretty hard news in verse 18. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted but when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. Peter, you will stretch out your hands. In other words, you will be crucified. Truly, truly, Peter, you can take this to the bank. I am calling you to something that you would never have chosen. And did you notice that? When you were young, you used to dress yourself, and you used to walk wherever you wanted, but when you were old, another will carry you to a place you do not want to go. Peter, I'm calling you to something hard, terrifying, difficult, 
excruciating, humiliating. I am calling you to the shame of a cross. You know, sometimes Jesus calls us to very hard places. Sometimes Jesus calls us to engage in very difficult relationships. Sometimes Jesus Jesus calls us to do excruciating things. For some of us, it's a fruitless ministry, at least by all appearances. For others, it's a lifeless marriage. For some, it is single parenting, and for others, it is just singleness. Sometimes Jesus calls us to raising children who are going to be dependent their whole lives and cannot dress themselves and cannot, cannot sustain their own existence And sometimes he calls us to bear children who will not survive. Sometimes following Jesus means following him and his call into a martyr's death. That's what it meant for Peter. Verse 19. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to Peter, Follow me. Well, after receiving that word, Peter turns and he sees John in verse 20. And he sees John doing what he is doing. Did you notice that? John is following him. John, too, gets to follow Jesus. And so Peter wants to know, Jesus... What about this man, verse 21? See, what's Peter doing? He is comparing himself to John. He he says that Jesus, if I'm going to have to die like this, if I'm going to have to suffer like this, if this is what following you means for me, then what is it going to mean for him? Because I want to make sure that this works out. You know, John, he was the guy that was always besting Peter. Do you know that? Just think about what's happened the last couple weeks. I mean, it's John who gets to be right next to Jesus at the Last Supper, the honored seat, and gets to lean on his chest. And it's John who has the social capital to get Peter in to to Caiaphas' palace. And it's John, remember, who beat Peter in a race, in a foot race, to the tomb. And it's John who recognized Jesus on the shore earlier that day when he called out to him. See, John is always besting Peter. John is like that guy, you know, who like, he gets everything. He looks good. He's smart. He gets the girl. He's athletic. And Peter wants to know, what about him? Is this going to work out evenly? Why does Peter compare himself to John? He compares himself to John because because we want things to be fair, right? I had just gotten done with um, a basketball camp. It was like a half-day basketball camp, and my friend's mom picked us up, and as a treat, she went through the McDonald's drive-thru. I thought it was a treat for us. Now that I'm a parent, I know that it was a treat for her right? She didn't have to fix lunch, and we could eat greasy food. So we go back to uh, the house where uh, we are all given our Happy Meals, which I was very excited about because Happy Meals are um, the most amazing thing that you've ever seen for 30 seconds. And then uh, she hands me mine, and I start to take my fry, and I start to put it in my mouth. And all of a sudden, I hear my friend yell, Mom! 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 Kyle's eating a fry! And I'm like, what? It's I don't understand. She's like, no, no, give me all your fries. So she takes all the fries. And she dumps them out in the center. And then she portions them out. Because, you know, not all the fries are equal on a Happy Meal. And things have to be fair. And we, we always want things to be fair. I, I, was, I almost was tempted to ask, like, do you measure each one? Just to make sure that it all works out, you know? This is the same linear foot as this fry pack. And we want things to work. We want things to be fair because we we fear that if they aren't fair, 
We fear that maybe Jesus loves someone else more than he loves us. We fear that if they aren't fair, then maybe Jesus, maybe he blesses someone else more than he blesses us. We, and we also wonder, we wonder, maybe he loves someone less than us, and maybe he blesses someone less than us. And, and if, if we can't compare, then how are we going to know how much he loves us? And if we can't compare, then how are we going to be able to tell whether or not we got a raw deal? And so we compare. Peter compares. What about this man? What's he going to get? Is it all going to work out? But I want you to notice how Jesus responds. Did you see how Jesus responds? Verse 22. If it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? Follow me. Notice that Jesus does not tell Peter John's story. Notice what Jesus does not do. Jesus does not say, listen, John is going to face some severe persecution. He's going to be exiled to the island of Patmos, not the persecution. He's going to have this amazing vision where, where he is called up in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and he's going to see some things that nobody else has seen, not the persecution. Then, thousands of years, people are going to misinterpret that book. That's the persecution. And then, to top it all off, they're going to write novels about it called the Left Behind series that are just horrible. And then, they're going to make a horrible movie about it. I mean, could you imagine? This is way worse than crucifixion. But Jesus doesn't do that. He could have told him John's story. He doesn't tell him John's story. He says simply, if it's my will that John remain, what is that to you? I'm not telling you John's story. In his fairy tale, The Horse and His Boy, C.S. Lewis writes about a little boy named, or a boy named Shasta, and his long adventure with his travel companion, Erebus. Through this adventure, this long and arduous adventure, they, they face lions and all kinds of things. And they get to the end, and all of a sudden, a voice speaks to Shasta. He encounters a voice, a word. And he's in the middle of this conversation, and with this voice... And Shasta says, don't you think it was bad luck to meet so many lions? There is only one lion, the voice said. What on earth do you mean? I've just told you that there were at least two the first night and there was only one. But he was swift of foot. How do you know? I was the lion. And as Shasta gasped, with open mouth and said nothing, the voice continued. I was the lion who forced you to join with Erebus. I was the cat who comforted you among the houses of the dead. I was the lion who drove the jackals from you while you slept. I was the lion who gave the horses the new strength of fear for the last mile so that you should reach King Loon in time. And I was the lion you do not remember who pushed the boat in which you lay, a child near death, so that it came to shore where the man sat, wakeful at midnight, to receive you. And Shasta says, Then it was you who wounded Erebus. It was I. But what for? Child, the voice said, I'm telling you your story not hers. I tell no one any story but his own. Not long after this, Aslan the lion explains to Erebus her wounds, how each wound was pound for pound the same affliction that she had caused her mother's slave girl when she ran away. And Erebus wants to know, will the slave suffer more? Aslan says, I am telling you your story, not hers. 
It's actually a theme in the Chronicles of Narnia. When we get to the end of the voyage of the Dawn Treader, the young girl Lucy asks whether her cousin Eustace will return to Narnia when she finds out that she won't. And Aslan responds, do you really need to know that? Jesus is telling Peter his story and not John's. Jesus doesn't tell Peter any story but his own. And when Peter asks about John, the question is, does Peter really need to know that? You follow me. What is that to you? The former Archbishop of Canterbury, Rowan Williams, wrote in reflecting on these passages in the Chronicles of Narnia that one of the simplest and most popular distractions that we have developed so as not to have to cope with the truth about ourselves is to spend time and energy looking at others and their failings. We compare. We spend so much time and energy comparing. And what is that to you? You follow me. Because where do these comparisons really get us anyway? Have you ever thought about that? I mean, is it really possible to compare your story with another's? Is it possible to compare your suffering with another's suffering? Is it possible to compare your grief with another's grief? Is it possible, even possible, to compare your blessing with another's blessing? What metrics would you use? To compare. See, I would suggest to you that comparison is not only fruitless and doesn't help, it's also futile. It's impossible because each death, each loss, each grief, each joy, each blessing and responsibility are completely and totally unique because each person and each person's story is completely and totally unique. How can you compare? How can you compare one child to another? How can you compare one person's suffering to another? Suffering is like a snowflake where there are no two alike. And yet in certain respects, they are all alike. When Flannery O'Connor's pen pal came out to her, She responded like this. I think no different of you. What is true of you in one particular way is true of every one of us in our own particular way. The fall has happened to us all. We are all broken. Our brokenness takes many forms. If we surrender to it, it destroys us. If we embrace it as our cross and give it to God, it redeems us. That is what grace is. We live in a fallen world and each of us, each of us has to carry a cross, but those crosses are very particular. For some of you, it's sexual desire and orientation. For others of you, it's migraines. For others of you, it's a wayward child. And you know what? We can't compare them. And it's not worth trying. We say, I know how you're feeling, but no one really does. Because each suffering is unique. Each pain, each heartache is unique. So it's not worth comparing our marriages or our careers or our responsibilities or our churches or our ministries or our health problems or our children or our lack thereof. In his book, Parental Math, Bob Benson writes about taking one of his sons and dropping him off at college. Wednesday night... Mike slept downstairs in his room where children belong, and we slept upstairs in ours where moms and dads belong. Thursday night, we were 350 miles away, and he was in Ramada, 325, and we were in 323 in connecting rooms. We left the door open, and we talked, and we laughed together. Friday night, he was in the freshman dorm, and we were still in 323. 
Sunday night, we were home, and he was 323 miles away in Chapman 309. Now, we have been through this before, Benson writes, and we thought we knew how to handle separation pretty well. Somebody said, you still have three at home, three fine kids, and there's plenty of laughter, plenty of noise, plenty of sports games to go to, plenty of everything, except Mike. In parental math, five minus one just doesn't equal plenty. And I was thinking about God, Benson says. He sure has plenty of children, plenty of artists, plenty of singers, plenty of preachers, plenty of candlestick makers, plenty of everybody, except you. And no one can ever take your place. You are unique. And your story is unique. You are absolutely unique. Like John and Peter are absolutely unique. They are not the same person. You see, you see, Peter was boisterous and John was quiet. Peter was always jumping ahead and John was always staying behind. And Jesus, he loves John and he loves Peter uniquely and completely in their unique selves. And he calls Peter and he calls John uniquely and completely. He calls Peter to die three decades later, a martyr's death. He calls John to remain and to stick around. He calls Peter to pastor. He calls John to prophesy. He calls them uniquely and completely. Jesus tells Peter how his life is going to end, how he's going to die an excruciating death, and how harmful it will be for him. But not really. That's not what Jesus is telling Peter. Jesus is telling Peter how he will glorify him. Did you catch that, verse 19? This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, Follow me. And this is what Peter needs to know. And this is all that Peter needs to know. Peter, this is the path that I have given you. And therefore, this is the path through which you are going to bring me the most glory. And God calls us all on different paths to glorify him. Some of us he calls to glorify him in notoriety. And some of us he calls to glorify him in anonymity. Some of us he calls to glorify him in singleness, and some of us he calls to glorify him in marriages. Some of us he calls to glorify him in small churches, and some of us he calls to glorify him in big churches. Some of us he calls to glorify him in riches, and some of us he calls to glorify him in poverty. Some of us he calls to glorify him in family, and some of us in fraternity. Some of us he calls to glorify him with with our minds, and some of us he calls to glorify him with, with our hands. Some of us in heartache and some of us in health. And some of us are called to glorify God for four and a half hours in a delivery room. Ed prayed earlier about Drew and Rebecca Boa and how they lost their child, Josiah. I was praying for them a lot this weekend and thinking about them a lot. And I was thinking a lot about John 21. I said, why God, why? Why this path for Drew and Rebecca? And why this path for Josiah? Drew sent me the text and he said that Josiah lived for four and a half hours and that it was an answer to prayer because that is what we prayed for, that they would be able to meet him and be with him. And reflecting on this text and reflecting on Josiah, I I wrote this to him back. So amazing and hard and sad and weighty. Josiah met his mom and dad at three. He met his heavenly father and heavenly bridegroom only four and a half hours later. 
His singular life is no less meaningful for its brevity, no less glorifying to God. And that is why I am sure he got just as hearty a commendation as any when he crossed the finish line. Well done, my good and faithful servant, my beloved Josiah, in whom I am well pleased. And if Josiah was called to live for four and a half hours, what is that to me? And if I am called to live another two years or another 80 years, what is that to you? We are called to follow God on the path that he has given us. And this is how, whatever path he's given us, that is the path which brings him the most glory. You see, Jesus will not evaluate your and my life based on how well we walk another's path. Jesus will evaluate your and my life based on how well we walk the path that he has given us to walk. Pablo Picasso said that that when he was a child, his mother said to him, if you become a soldier, you'll be a general. If you become a monk, you'll be a pope. Instead, I became a painter and I wound up as Picasso. You will... You will walk whatever path God has given you. And, and Jesus will not judge you based on your superiority or inferiority over anybody else. No preacher, no church, no ministry, no husband, no wife, no son, no daughter, no parent, no child, no scholar, nor anything else. But he has given you and me a path. He has called us to glorify him on that path, and that is the path on which he meets us. Did you hear? Follow me. This is where you find me, Peter. This is where you get me, Peter. So whatever doubts or concerns you have that you might be missing out or they might be missing out, what you need to know is that I am with you, just like I am with them. Peter, I will be with you on the cross just like I will be with John on the island. Peter, I will be with you when your hands are pierced just like I will be with John when he loses his mind. And and Peter, I will be with you in ways that you could never imagine when you were hanging on the cross just like I will be with John in ways that he can only imagine when he is on the Spirit and the Lord's day. See, he calls Peter to go and die, and he calls John to remain. But however you skin it, he calls them both to be with him. Because that's where Jesus meets us, on the path that he's called us. And that's where his grace is found. So hear his call this morning. Whatever he's called you to do, wherever he's called you to go, Whatever trials and whatever triumphs, whatever blessings, whatever hardships, follow him. His grace is sufficient for you there. Amen.